next. Tragedy strikes. Accidents happen. Be there when the calls come in. It's back-to-back -back episodes of Rescue 911. Next on Discovery Health Channel. Today on Rescue 911, a tragic accident leaves a boy near death as a nurse races to help at the scene. All I could see was his chest and that his left arm was up under his body. And gets her own terrifying shock. And I said, no, I said, that's my son. Then, 911. We begin late on the night of June 24th, 1987, as three teenage friends were coming back from playing pool in Knoxville, Tennessee. Well, what we know happened, one of the kids had a false ID, and they had picked up some liquor. They were drunk, so none of the three should have been driving. I guess at that age, we think we're invincible. We think, well, that can't happen to us. Seventeen-year-old Mike Faircloth was driving that night. I don't know exactly how fast I was going. It's a real, real windy road. It was dark. One minute, you're having a good time. One second later, your life has changed that fast. Less than a mile down the road, Donna Davis had just gotten home from work. It was clearly a crash, and I thought, I'm going to go back there. So I got in the car, and I started driving back. Across the road from the accident, a neighbor called 911. And I got around the curve, and I saw the car, and it looked bad. The car had hit the tree head on, so the front of the car was smashed in, broken windshield, laying on its roof. I had worked in emergency rooms, intensive care units, and my nursing background kicked in at that point. It looked pretty bad, but the driver was unconscious. And in the back, there was a boy that was crying, screaming that he was hurt. And finally, the driver came to, and it was kind of slow, and he, he looked over to the side, the passenger side, and he said, Oh, my buddy, my buddy's hurt bad. And it just took, kind of took my breath away. I said, are you telling me there's another boy in this car? And he says, oh, this dude's hurt bad. I remember flashes. The, it, the car was crushed so far down that you couldn't see Trent at all. He was up underneath pretty much the floorboard. All I could see was his chest and that his left arm was up under his body. And his left hand was ice cold, and I could not feel a pulse at all. Oh. But what struck me the most was that he sounded like he was slurping through a straw at the bottom of a glass. And all I realized was he didn't have clear airway. I ran my hand into his mouth, and blood just came pooling out. I just remember thinking, God, I feel so sorry for this kid's parents, because it will be just a miracle if he lives. There were times my heart was beating so hard because he quit breathing. I was so scared he was going to die. And I kept talking to him, and I'd say, look, you are too young to die. If you'll just hang in there, we'll get you out of here. Follow unsung heroes saving lives and witness courage and compassion in action. Okay, I'll be in the back. I'm going to be in the back of the ambulance waiting for you. Paramedics, next on Discovery Health Channel. Ride the razor's edge between life and death with the people who walk it every day. 
Trauma, Life in the ER, tonight at 7 Eastern, only on Discovery Health Channel. Within seven minutes, members of the Knoxville Volunteer Emergency Rescue Squad arrived at the scene, led by Captain John Yu. The tree was down across the road. I parked on one side of that. He started up the generator on the rescue truck. So I remember approaching the car and seeing the car upside down, a person still hanging upside down, and uh, no words coming from their mouth. What do you got here, lady? He was so calm. And I told him, this boy's got massive facial injuries. He's in a coma. I think he's got a really bad injury to his arm because I can get no pulse. It's ice cold. I said, but if we don't get him out of here, he's going to die. He can't breathe. We knew that we had very little time to do it. Immediately commandeered some people to help carry equipment over to the scene. I need some more help here. We stabilized the vehicle and then uh, immediately hooked up the jaws of life, started the generator. Donna's son, Brett Winston, worked at a restaurant in town. I had just come home and I heard all the sirens. I, I knew somebody had wrecked or something had happened. And I was thinking it could have possibly been my mom. I just thought maybe I should just go up there and see what's going on. The first thing I see is my mom was over there by the car, so I just stood back. They pulled him out, laid him on that backboard, and when they did, I saw the eyebrows and I saw the hair. I knew. I mean, I knew. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't say it. I just, I just kept shaking my head. No. And I, all I could get out was no. I said, no. And finally, I think it was the sheriff or someone looked at me and said, what? And I said, no. I said, it's my son. It's my son. When, when we continue. I told Brett, it's really, really bad, and your brother may not live. And I thought, this is a bad dream. This could not be happening. Tomorrow, a man gets a complete cosmetic body lift. A woman changes her smile with reconstructive surgery. A baby undergoes cleft lip correction surgery. Watch Stories from the OR tomorrow on Discovery Health Channel. Because of the darkness, Donna had not been able to recognize that the critically injured youth she'd been caring for was her older son, Trent, who lived with his father. And I thought, this is a bad dream. This could not be happening. And then it was, can we get him to the hospital alive? Here we go. Good deal. All okay, right. mask trousers, please. I told Brett, it's really, really bad. And your brother may not live. Yeah, he may not live. This is, this is, this is bad. The other two boys had cuts, bruises, and some broken bones, but were not seriously injured. While Trent was taken to the hospital, Donna went to call her former husband, Jerry, and tell him what had happened. When I got that call from Donna, that was the worst moment of my life. She normally keeps her composure quite good, so she was in a real panic, so I knew there was some big-time problems. Trent was admitted to Park West Hospital, where he was examined by Dr. Bill Bedwell. All right, let's get lab in here, staff. When I first saw Trent, he was bloody all over. He had arms and legs that were broken, multiple fractures, facial fractures, and was comatose and unresponsive. But my biggest concern was his closed head injury and his neurologic status, whether or not he would ever wake up. 
Dr. Bedwell met with Trent's family to inform them of his condition. He said it's very serious and the next 72 hours would be very critical. What I read from him was if we lives through 72 hours, we've got a shot at it. As every day went by, it became harder and harder. But I could not leave that hospital. I was not going to have, he was just not going to be alone, period. And if, if he died, he was not going to die without somebody sitting there. Trini, it's June 28th. When I would go in and talk to him, the nurses would say, he knows that you're here because when he hears your voice, his heart rate goes up. And then I started telling him, it's getting towards the 4th of July. I said, you always liked 4th of July and the big firework display in town. And every day I'd go in and I'd talk to him more about it. 10 days had passed since the accident. Trent was still in a coma. On the 4th of July, all day long, I said, Trent, you've got to wake up. It's the 4th of July. You're going to miss it. It's about gone. Hey, nothing, not a movement, hey. not a wiggle, nothing. Hey, guy. Come on, honey. We've waited too long. And finally, he opened his eyes, and he just hey. looked at me a minute, and then he went right back to sleep. But he opened his eyes on the 4th of July. Five and a half weeks after coming out of his coma, Trent was transferred to the Patricia Neal Rehabilitation Center and put under the care of physical therapist Patsy Cannon. When I first saw Trent, he was um, lying in the bed. He was very restless and thrashing around. He started talking after he's in rehab probably a couple weeks. And he started saying one word at a time, and then he started making sentences. And just like a child, Trent learned how to do all those things again. He was at Patricia Neal four months. They did wonders with him. And I thought, we're gonna, we're gonna make it, it's just gonna be slow. We're gonna make it. It's been four years since Trent Winston nearly lost his life in the car accident. I don't remember a whole lot of that night. My first real firm memory are being at Patricia Neal Hospital, and I couldn't talk. It's really weird being 19 years old, and all of a sudden, you can't remember the language you've been speaking your whole life. My mom motivated me. I've got to give her a lot of credit. I mean, she got on my nerves, but she motivated me. We spent a lot of time in rehab facilities, and what I, what I saw were individuals who had strong family support, a lot of love and a lot of family support, always did better. They always made better recoveries than anyone thought they would make. <laughs> he beat all the odds. I mean, he beat every one of the physician's predictions all the way through. And he's still the same kid, which is really a wonderful thing. Trent has remained close friends with Mike, who was driving that night. <laughs> the scariest thing about the accident was thinking about whether or not he was going to make it or not. You don't understand how it feels until something like that happens to you. Drinking and driving don't mix. Drinking and driving kills. A lot of people have to learn that the hard way. And a lot of times, the hard way makes you dead. You don't ever quit rehabilitating. The way I think is there's nothing I can't do until I've already so failed at it. And nobody's going to stop me from making myself better. Next, step inside the command center where the calls for help are answered and meet the real-life heroes who save lives. Stay tuned for another episode of Rescue 911. Next on Discovery Health Channel. Real life. Medicine. Miracles. Mr. Shapiro, step out of the car, please. 